Hey everybody, it's Ian Cunningham from Vector GB here. I'm going to talk to you today, today about certificate-based authentication in diagnostics and what's possible with UDS and Autozar right now. So this is a relatively new topic, hopefully really interesting for lots of you. Um, I have a demo of this as well. So this is the first of a, a little sequence of videos. Uh, the second video will, will be in the demo, but before I did the demo, I thought it'd be really interesting to make sure everyone actually understands what's possible in in this area so security um is, is a big topic certificate or based authentication is just part of of this big topic uh, so we'll have a quick recap on on what's possible in security in autos are let's let's assume we're interested specifically in autos are for now so um what topics do we possibly have well we have in security things like secured onboard communication where we want to authenticate or encrypt messages that are used by our issues in the normal communication in this case we want to make sure that our issues are protected against replay attacks so somebody logs a set of transactions between an ECU and then tries to force a specific behavior in the system in the vehicle by replaying that sequence of messages or part of that sequence of messages to an ECU we want to not allow that to happen could be very bad um, so we want to protect against these kind of scenarios and this brings a concept of freshness management into into our vehicle so how do we determine a message is sufficiently fresh for us to say this is not being replayed this is a real request additionally we need to think about secret management so with security we start to think about topics like looking after secret keys or certificates in the case of diagnostics and how we support these in oem uh, specific ways for, so different vehicle manufacturers have different thoughts on this so we need to support those and then of course secure diagnostics so how do we restrict access to functions or, or data that we may be able to trigger with, with these, uh, within our ECUs? Maybe even restrict the ECUs that people are able to interact with using diagnostics. And of course, restricting specific use cases. So maybe the limit the ability to read data or restrict who is able to do reprogramming. And for this last set of cases, we have a new UDS service, Unified Diagnostic Services, uh, UDS. So we have a new service in the standard, uh, which was published at the start of 2020. So this is ISO 14229 part one, introduces service 29 hex. And this is a new service for diagnostic tester authentication. It's split into a, a few different sections. Um, one of them deals with authentication with PKI certificate exchange, public key infrastructure. And this relies on asymmetric cryptography. This is introduced in Autozar 4.4.0. The other things that are in the ISO are presently defined as being out of scope of Autozar. So this text comes from the Autozar Diagnostic Communication Manager specification. Uh, there's a specific note in there that says, essentially Autozar only deals with the APCE case, authentication with PKI certificate exchange. Okay, so let's think about what this looks like, maybe if we compare it with security access. And it's important to note that this is not a replacement for security access. Just because we have authentication doesn't mean that we don't necessarily have security access still. So security access is going to stay around for some time to come because not all ECUs need the level of protection that authentication comes because authentication comes with a cost due to this part here. So security access, let's have a recap. Service 27 hex, we have a concept of security level. We do symmetric cryptography usually, sometimes very simple, sometimes we're just flipping bits. We have a shared secret between the tester and the ECU and that is a transformation which is applied to a number uh, to generate an answer. So what happens is the ECU generates a number, sends it to the tester, both the tester and the ECU apply the set of transformations or calculations to the number, the tester sends it its result, 
back to the ECU. If that number matches what the ECU has calculated in parallel, the, t the ECU says, you know my secret, therefore I'm going to trust you. So this uh, doesn't have to be complicated. And typically this is only applied um, to a selection of, of things. So maybe writing data to ECUs, maybe doing software update, um, interacting with IO. These are the things that are protected. It's yeah, simple. It's not really very secure necessarily because this algorithm could be very simple, like reverse the bits um, or flip the bits. Um, to, to generate a seed from a key. And also within Autozar, there's only one security access state machine independent of how we're connected to the ECU. So if we consider that I have two connections between this ECU and my tester, so I have one which is CAN and one which is diagnostics on IP, uh, so uh, DOIP, um, I can authenticate on CAN or sorry, I can do security access on CAN with this ECU, and then I can switch to DOIP and I can do things that need security access because the ECU has been unlocked and that's it. This maybe sounds like a good feature, but it's not necessarily the case because we may not just have one tester. I may have an onboard tester, which is providing over the air functions. So if this tester unlocks ECUs for some reason, to do things, it means that if somebody comes along with another tester, plugs it into the J1962 connector, they can get access to the ECUs with the security level that the onboard tester has applied. So this is not a good feature. Uh, it's a bit of a backdoor even you could think about. So, so authentication, different service, 2.9 hex versus 2.7. We have a concept of role rather than level. We use PKI certificates. We have a, a concept that probably nearly everything is protected. This is a more modern approach to security, which is we protect everything and then we poke holes in the security to let people get access where we specifically want them to have access. This is, this is a white listing approach over here. This is more like a black listing approach and a more modern approach is, is to apply white lists. Um, we have also, rather than possibly very simple algorithms, we have proper cryptographic authentication using certificates. We'll look at what this means. And importantly, autos are, if we use authentication, gives us an authentication state machine per physical layer. So what this means is that my onboard tester, which maybe is connected using CAN to an ECU and is doing things with that ECU, if somebody also tries to connect via DOIP for your Ethernet to that ECU and do things, they don't get any rights according to what my onboard tester has done. So I can be fully authenticated on board, but any offboard tester is completely unauthenticated. So each tester that connects has to explicitly authenticate with the ECUs in the vehicle to be able to do things. So we don't have this back door that we kind of talked about when, in the context of security access. So certificates, what does certificates mean? Well, we have a something called the chain of trust. Uh, we'll give a very quick overview of this. The, pr the purpose of today is, is not to do lots of stuff on PKI, public key infrastructure. So please feel free to, to look up on the internet. Essentially what we have is we have a, a chain of certificates. Now the root certificate, we have no way to verify the signature of this. And this means that root certificates are typically stored offline. And what we actually see when we look at a certificate authority using uh, requests to their infrastructure is an intermediate certificate. So here we see an intermediate certificate. This intermediate certificate um, is signed with the root certificate and we are then able to issue uh, other certificates based on this intermediate certificate. So this means that if something goes wrong and we need to revoke the certificate, which we're using to, to sign downstream certificates on the users, it means that we are able to protect our root certificates because these, if we lose these, we're really lost. We have no way to revoke these. Um, so we have a, a chain of trust, we have a hierarchy, and it means that we get uh, a, a sequence of uh, things. So the intermediate certificate 
we can verify using its public key the signature of a downstream certificate that was signed with the private key. Uh, and we have, yeah, this is a simplified view, typically many. You can right click on the padlock that you see in your web browser and you can look at the chain of trust. You can see how many certificates there are between your browser, the end user, and the certificate authority. There could be five or six even certificates in that, in that chain. So that's a very quick explanation. What do we typically want to do? Well, typically we kind of borrow the concept of, of levels from um, security access. So we have a, set, a concept of role. Now, once we've authenticated to a role, we uh, basically inherit the ability to do a load of stuff. So if I authenticate as a supplier, for example, and uh, my certificate identifies that it's um, giving me the, the rights of being a supplier, then I have a, a whitelist that gives me access to a load of different capabilities. Fantastic. The list of things that anybody can do without authentication is quite restricted. Maybe only OBD and authentication, even, maybe. So with security, um, with authentication, rather than security access style, security, uh, lots of securities in that sentence, sorry. Um, it's, you know, security access is, style security is good if we want coarse grained control, we unlock a level and we get a set of capabilities. Um, with real security access, so UDS service 27, we have a shared secret, a, a secret key algorithm. With authentication, we have PKI style security. And this means that we're able to transfer other data than just the means of, of, of saying we have authenticated. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we can maybe just say, well, the authentication that we're doing is limited to a specific user or maybe to a specific use case or a specific vehicle, a specific date, because we have a validity range, we can time out certificates. It may be even that we uh, re restrict things to a specific time or even a combination of everything. So the user Alex is permitted to perform key reprogramming on a specific vehicle on a specific date in a specific time slot. So this is the kind of level of, of granularity that we can get to. Um, additionally, on that certificate, we have this additional content. We can provide additional role, additional things that are allowed to be done by the holder of the certificate beyond what they get through authentication. So we authenticate and we get some rights, but then additionally, we can issue a temporary certificate that extends the capability to other things. So what this means is we can have maybe a, a slot which is third party um, tester and it gets essentially no rights, but we can generate certificates on the fly which allow people to do specific sets of things. So back to our train of trust. We have a, a very simplified view now. We just have one upstream certificate and two downstream certificates. So both of these certificates will have been signed with the public key of the upstream certificate. Sorry, will have been signed with the private key of the upstream certificate and the upstream certificate's public key is available, which means that the uh, certificate signatures can be verified. How does this work when we put those certificates on a tester and an ECU? So we connect up and using service 29, the tester is able to ask the ECU, what authentication method do you support? So it's using service 29 hex. We will either get service not supported, which kind of tells us no authentication at all, or we'll get an answer along the lines of I support APCE. Fantastic. So we support PKI certificate exchange. So what do we do next? From the tester side, we say, well, OK, here's my certificate. So we transfer the public key certificate, which contains the tester's public key and the signature for the certificate, which is generated from the private key. We do not send the private key. The private key remains private. It's the whole point, but we we send this information to the test to the ECU. The ECU is able to verify the certificate is overall valid by checking the signature based on the upstream public key, and it has the the public key from the certificate. What it doesn't know is that the tester actually owns this certificate. Okay, so it doesn't know 
that this wasn't just robbed off the internet from somewhere. So what the ECU is able to do is say, well, okay, prove that you really own that certificate. That certificate contains a public key. Here's some data. Sign it with your private key. I can then, as the ECU, verify the signature that you send back to me to understand that you really own the private key that relates to that certificate. So the tester sends back a response, the, the signature data, and the ECU is able to then verify that signature based on the, the public key. So this is, this is PKI certificate exchange. It's similar to the kind of thing that you would see in TLS on, in, on the internet. So if you know about that, you kind of understand this mechanism here. Um, and yeah, if we've done this successfully, then the, the, the tester uh, is known to have ownership of the certificate and we therefore authenticate the, the tester at the ECU and you get a positive response back. Fantastic. And we're able to show that it owns a certificate that was signed by a higher level certificate authority that we as an ECU trust. We haven't transferred any information about the ECU. We haven't transferred the private key. The private key remains private. All we've done is proved that we have access to the private key. So this is how we can authenticate. What's also possible? Well, also possible is the ability to persist through session changes, uh, the security state. So we have an explicit way to deauthenticate. We can also do bi-directional authentication. So I said just now, it's a bit like TLS. This is really like TLS. So both people, both parties will send certificates each way. There'll both be a challenge and, and proof of ownership each way. Uh, so we can make sure that we um, aren't being spied by a, a dummy ECU from a, a from a tester perspective. So we can protect the tester secrets. We can even be much more advanced. This is not really in the scope of the service, but um, we have the possibility that actually the tester doesn't carry a certificate at all. The tester is just a gateway that um, provides a, a, a relay point between a, an OEM server and the ECU. So what this means then is the authentication is done maybe with a user ID and a password between the tester and the server. So we can have accounts, which we can give rights to and revoke. And then effectively the server provides a temporary certificate to the tester. Um, the challenges sent by the ECU uh, to the tester, the tester sends a challenge onto the server and gets the response back and, and so on. So we, we protect ourselves. How do we support this in vector tools? We have something called a security manager. So we need to deal with lots of different sources of, of security information. It might be working with servers. It might be certificates. It could be a cloud infrastructure we need to talk with. That's a lot of complexity for our vector tools. What we do is we decouple the vector tool from this complexity um, with the security manager. We have a user interface that allows us to, to say what security sources we want to make available um, to, to vector tools. And then there's a real-time component, which allows the vector tools to actually connect to a specific source um, set of certificates that are stored locally or to a, 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 a certificate server or whatever. There's just, just then a defined interface then, and that's all we need to know is there's a defined interface here. The security manager lets us say, well, for a specific vector tool, this is how it can connect. We do not need to know any of the details of what's happening here at all from the vector perspective. So the secrets, the real secrets in the diagnostic process can really stay secret. We don't need to know them, um, but we can make our tools work with those secret things. So that's an introduction to authentication in diagnostics. Please um, give your comments, questions, and I look forward to you joining me in the next video where we'll actually see a demonstration of all this stuff we've just talked about in action. Thank you very much.